In many ways, the year 2005 may be a watershed for those of us interested in civil rights. The death of advocates like Rosa Parks, C. Dolores Tucker, and Constance Baker Motley signal a changing of the problems to be solved. Our guest, Herb Boyd, is a journalist, editor, writer, and teacher. His most recent book, We Shall Overcome, documents the history of the civil rights movement. Welcome to Evening Exchange. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you, Kojo. I mentioned a few well-known names there. There was one who also passed this year, who um, lived in this town for a long time, who also needs to be remembered. And what I'd like to do during the course of the next 30 minutes or so, uh -huh. I throw a number of names at you and <laughs> okay. ask you to explain for our viewers their role in the civil rights movement, who they were. Mm -hmm. James Foreman. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Well, you talk about, um, he died, uh, I think, January the 10th of this year. So the year hadn't really begun before we lost one of the real treasured fighters. I say freedom fighter. Mm -hmm. when, when I talk about somebody that really is emblematic and symbolizes a freedom fighter, it would be James Foreman for me. I think earlier we were chatting about mm -hmm. uh, his book, The Making of Black Revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. That book for me, Kojo, was virtually a Bible. Mm -hmm. In all of the courses I started to teach at Wayne State University back at the in the late 60s, mm -hmm. um, I mean, because what what you have with this book is a kind of a detail. I mean, it was almost like a diary. Mm -hmm. You know, you're mm -hmm. reading this man, and he's in and out of these different kind of situations. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the founders of SNCC. Founders of the first executive uh, director, as such. Mm -hmm. um, he had gone south after out of Chicago mm -hmm. uh, at Roosevelt College there and had got into journalism and when the whole situation of Little Rock broke mm -hmm. he, 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 he said I gotta be there <laughs> I gotta be there and that was his real he stepped into the civil rights movement through Little Rock mm -hmm. and then from there on there was not a major battleground during the civil rights movement that he wasn't there in some shape or form. <clears throat> in, indeed, he was a little older than most of his contemporaries in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating At least a committee. decade or so older. Older than mm -hmm. they were. And so he mentored a lot of the people who became well known afterwards, the Stokely Carmichaels and the uh, Julian Bonds, etc., who were in the Student oh, Nonviolent yes. Coordinating Committee. I mean, Bob Moses, mm -hmm. Diane Nash, John Lewis. You know, Marion Barry, anybody connected, anybody connected to SNCC at that time had to be touched by James Foreman and Ella Baker. Ella Baker. <laughs> There's <Yeah>. another one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, t let's talk about some more people who passed this year sure. also. See Dolores Stucker. Yes, uh, and now uh, two, two of my friends approached me and said that, uh, are you going to be going to her funeral, and I say I won't be able to do it because we were all caught up with, uh, you know, dealing, because we'd had, what, just before her death, there was three, uh, we lost three very significant African Americans, almost in a rapid succession. Um, August Wilson. The playwright. Constance Baker Modley. Uh, and Nipsey Russell. Correct. They all went within, on a weekend. Mm -hmm. And then right behind that, here comes C. Dolores Tucker. Mm -hmm. I had re, uh, I had a couple of conversations with her. In fact, uh, I was interviewing Dick Gregory, mm -hmm. and he was on his way to the funeral. Okay. He was on his way to the funeral. He told uh, me that uh, I said, well, you know, I was in Philadelphia. I think yeah. going back to Philadelphia. Yeah. As a matter funeral. of fact, familiarly known to everybody as C. C. Dolores Tucker was yes. the Secretary of State of the states of, State of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. a founder of the National Black Women's Political Movement, yes. and a mainstay of the Civil Rights Movement. Oh, and Constance Baker Motley. Well, hey, you do so well. You do so well with C. <laughs> Dolores Tucker. Why'd you keep it going? <laughs> Constance Baker Motley was a woman who did not get the publicity she deserved for mm -hmm. being at the forefront of most of the major legal battles fought during the civil rights era, including Brown versus, versus Board of Education. Exactly. She was at the center of all of those and went on to have a stellar career as first a lawyer and then a judge in the state of New York. Constance she was Baker the Martin. first. Uh, a number of firsts, so many firsts was attached to her name. Mm -hmm. We'd spend the rest of your show talking about <laughs> all the firsts with her. And uh, one of the things that perhaps uh, for me was the significantly so was her involvement with James Meredith. Mm -hmm. Because that was virtually her introduction because she was the first woman attorney hired by the NAACP. Mm -hmm. Thurgood Marshall brought her in. Mm -hmm. uh, about two weeks ago, I had an interview with Robert Carter. Mm -hmm. Now, here's another unheralded, unheralded, Song 
uh, attorney, and he went south. The two of them went south together, Robert Carter and uh, Constance Baker Motley. They went south to deal in 1962, because uh -huh. at, at that time, James Meredith was trying to integrate uh, the, the University, University of Mississippi. Of Mississippi. And of course, Oxford just turned into an absolute madhouse down there in terms of the turmoil and turbulence. So here she was, and, and Thurgood always said that he rationalized and justified sending her down there because she was a woman. <laughs> and he figured that that they would be not as intensely hostile to her presence there as, she w as they would with a, a black man attorney coming down there. So that was one of the reasons he said he chose to send her down there. And then it was a number of other cases that she was involved in, as you said earlier, right on down through, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and beyond Brown versus Board of Education, becoming like a, one of the first judges in the uh, cir circuit court up mm -hmm. in, in New York. I mean, just an outstanding jurist. Really outstanding. I'm glad you mentioned the name Jer James Meredith. I want to get back to it, but first I want to go to Rosa Parks. Yes. Because there are those who think that Rosa Parks just one day was a seamstress who just got tired one day and simply refused to get up. But Rosa Parks was an activist long before that. Oh, indeed. <laughs> I think, you know, we always talk about the, and in fact, uh, as we talk, I don't know if we can mention the fact that, you know, her funeral is going on, you know. Yeah, as we are as, as we're taking this interview, right her, funeral her funeral is taking is place in Detroit. In Detroit. Uh, my hometown. Okay. <laughs> so it was I was eager to see that earlier when I got to town and went over to one of your fantastic restaurants and ran <laughs> into some of these other celebrities maybe we can talk about later right. on. But uh, yeah, see, even in death though, Kojo, I mean, she's setting precedent. Mm -hmm. This is the first woman to lie in state at the uh, Capitol Rotunda. Mm -hmm. um, I think only the second black person because I think the uh, the guard, uh, Jacob Chestnut, who, who was shot and killed sure. there, so sure. he was the first black uh, to lie in state. So even Rosa in Parks death, you know, the Secretary of the Montgomery, Alabama NAACP. She had been active. The discussion about whether or not to do something about being forced to move to the back of the bus was a discussion that had been taking place for a long time. A long time. And she decided she would take that step. You know, one of the things about that is that um, we always talk about the woman behind the man, mm -hmm. but in Rosa's case, you can talk about the man behind the woman. And he suffered. And, and never got the proper kind of recognition because as we put Rosa in both a human, historical, and political perspective, we also have to do it with her husband, Raymond, because he introduced her to the struggle. He He's brought her day. in. Uh, he was 10 years older than she was. Uh, I think they got together in 1931, 1932, mm -hmm. right in the midst of the, uh, this country's uh, worst depression. And uh, at that time, we had a case called the Scottsboro Boys. Mm -hmm. Now, some of your viewers may be familiar with them, these nine youth who were hitchhiking, hoboing on trains. And it wasn't unusual at that time for people to be moving around the country trying to find jobs and everything. And mm -hmm. so they jumped on this train in Chattanooga on their way to uh, Memphis. And of course, to do that, the train has to swing through the, the northern parts of Alabama. Mm -hmm. And that's there, and they uh, had this encounter on the train with, with a mob of white youth. They threw them all off the train. Mm -hmm. They called ahead after being thrown off the train. They phoned ahead, and the deputy sheriff and a number of his, and a number of his uh, white friends all showed up at the station, snatched them all off the uh, train, threw them in jail, both the blacks and the whites. But the next day, before the magistrate, they bring out this, these two white women who charged the black men with rape. So this case became, I don't want to spend too much time with oh, that, but the, but the case became like Scott's a call boy. celeb. And that's where Raymond got involved. Mm -hmm. So he was active being from Montgomery. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that far, you know, so the whole Alabama situation was one that was um, of some concern for him. So he was also a member of the NAACP. Mm -hmm. By trade, he was a barber. He lost his job after Rosa Parks refused his... Exactly. To, uh, they both. Up. Both, both of them. Jobs, they, yeah. That's one of the reasons they had to get out of Dodge, so to speak, <laughs> <laughs> because they were in the crosshairs. I mean, you have to understand that homes had been firebombed and mm -hmm. everything down there. So um, uh, she was like persona non grata. Which is exactly why they went to Detroit. And in Detroit, of course, was one Herb Boyd, who got involved in many ways in all of this because you got to know Malcolm X. In oh, Detroit. yes. All right. Talk about that. Yeah, well, 
In fact, I guess I met Malcolm before I met Rosa, because uh -huh. Rosa arrived in 1957. Mm -hmm. I guess she was going back and forth a couple times before that. She went to Hampton University for a minute uh, to run some kind of a dormitory down there, but eventually settled in Detroit by 1957. Mm -hmm. And by 64, 65, she was involved in John Conyers' campaign, and that's where I first met her. So that's 64, 65. I had met, met Malcolm when I was 20, so that's 1958. I just wow. told people. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so in 1958, I met Malcolm through my cousin, who was in the Nation of Islam at that time. And he knocked on my door one evening and said, Herb, I'm going fishing. I said, fishing? You know, where's your fishing pole? He said, no, 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 I'm recruiting. And he had a bundle of Muhammad Speaks papers under his arm, and I went out with him. And that was my introduction to the Nation of Islam. And of course, by that time, Malcolm was a national spokesperson uh -huh. for the uh, NOI. And he would just periodically come back in to speak at Mosque Number no. One in Detroit. So I was always right down front. <laughs> well, it, in very many ways, it can be argued that that's where the book "We Shall Overcome" began. Yes, yeah, it certainly does. Malcolm. Certainly does. And I think that I continue to be a Malcolmite. Uh, you see, this book is all about the uh, civil rights movement, mm -hmm. but I have to frankly confess that I was a Malcolmite. So I was <laughs> yeah. to Malcolm was, was not very fond of the phrase we <laughs> should overcome. Not very fond of it at all. <laughs> but what I try to do in this book is to bring these two uh, movements together, the mm -hmm. civil rights movement and the human rights struggle or mm -hmm. the black liberation struggle, mm -hmm. because I see them uh, in, a, in a continuous way. I see it not as separate struggles, but, you know, different kind of strategies and tactics with similar objectives, you might say. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you could tell our viewers how it came together has to do with how the Black Panther Party got its name. Because that name came out of the activities of a civil rights organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and its experiences in Alabama. Exactly, Lowndes County, <laughs> down in Lowndes County, and their symbol was the Panther. So when why? Yeah, yeah. It, it, why was their symbol? They the were saying that they wanted to have a symbol that began to suggest. First of all, you don't mess with a panther. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, particularly when you try to corner it. And, and they were in Lowndes County in a predominantly white population trying to register blacks to vote and, and, and organize. And they had to have a symbol that showed that they were going to survive. That exactly. They, that they were not afraid. That they not were afraid. Fight. And the panther certainly symbolizes that. In fact, when uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale out in Merritt College, out in Oakland, California, when they was thinking on what they was going to call the organization everything, the Black Panther, they, they had to seek permission. They actually called members of SNCC mm -hmm. and said, can we have permission to use this symbol and, and also to take the name? But mm -hmm. it was a black party, uh, political party for self-defense. You know, uh -huh. they had the self-defense thing in there. And I think that's very important to talk about that. In the same way, as we talk about the civil rights movement, people talking about them as, you know, integrationist movement. But I think it was mostly a desegregation movement. Indeed and there was just was. less interested, I think, in really integrating and far more interested in knocking down Jim Crow laws, knocking down the walls of segregation, American apartheid. Indeed, it was a desegregation movement that led to the creation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, being comprised uh, essentially of young people who were students, moved in a more militant direction, adopting the slogan Black Power. The Black Panther Party comes along, adopts the Panther symbol yes, yeah. from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, makes people People like Rap Brown and Stokely Carmichael, honorable lead, honorary leaders of the Black Panther That's Party. That's true. And then the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Why the for self-defense? I think they were trying to say is that uh, uh, we're not necessarily going on the offense, mm -hmm. but if you attack us again, the whole Panther thing comes into play, that we're going to defend ourselves to the death. We will fight to the death. So it was a self-defense uh, mode and measure that began to express itself in a number of ways in terms of like not only self-defense from a military or picking up the gun, but also in terms of health, mm -hmm. in terms of feeding our children, mm 
-hmm. in terms of taking care of our age, uh, aged people in our, in our communities, providing mm -hmm. them kind of services and support systems. Mm -hmm. So they had a little bit more in mind than picking up a gun, but of course that became, you know, it kind of predominated. Mm -hmm. And I saw the COINTEL Pro, that's all, this is a counterintelligence program that was put together by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. That's all they needed, you know, in terms of precipitate this year move on them with the deaths of Mark Clark and Fred Hampton in 69 in Chicago, which of course, and little Bobby Hutton out there. I used to pick up the Black Panther paper and it was almost like reading a black obituary page in terms of people, our radicals while. and militants out there. After, you know, I wish this conversation could go on forever because I like to compare it to today in one respect that I reflect on a lot. I joined the Black Panther Party for a brief while in New York in 1968. Mm -hmm. And the Black Panther Party at that time was moving in the direction of Marxism, Marxism-Leninism oh, at that point. exactly true. And it was a point at which they made the argument that the revolution as they saw it would be led by the Bloods, the Brothers on the Block. It was a kind of romanticizing. The lumpen proletariat. The lumpen it. proletariat. Yes. Yeah. It was a romanticizing of those black people who lived on the edge of society, the, 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 the hustlers, the, the, the people who hung on the corner, the pimps, etc., etc. And I see a reflection of that in today's popular hip hop culture, mm -hmm. in which there is a still there is another kind of romanticizing of street life, don't you see that? Oh yeah, the so-called thug life, as yeah, they call it now, yeah, right? Yeah. And I, I think what it happens is, is so much of that is, is so important in terms of, um, you know, the commentary on society. Mm -hmm. And I think we, the artists, you know, some of the better artists coming out of hip hop and the rap community have done just a remarkable job of like holding a mirror up to society and so we begin to see exactly what's going on of course even when it comes to Rosa Parks you know we have some excesses there mm -hmm. and so we have some work to do to make sure and I think her funeral is going on now and the kind of coverage is getting will ha help to balance off some of the kind of derogatory or disparaging things that have come from some of our rap groups as well as some of the films about out there. Rosa Parks about indeed, Rosa in the Parks. film barbershop in particular exactly we, we remember that um, is that one of the motivations for the book We Shall Overcome so that young people in particular can get an understanding of the historical thread that they're a part of? Indeed. And it's a media fusion book. So that means you're going to have to meet these young people where they are. <laughs> and they're like into the computers and they're into the, the, uh, the movies and the MTV that whole MTV generation, you know, where it's boom, 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 boom. It's the, uh, you know, attention span is not very long, so you better grab them and it better be good. Mm -hmm. And so we tried a media fusion book because the book has two CDs attached, narrated by the uh, late Ossie Davis and uh, his lifelong companion, Ruby D. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's pretty much the last project they did together before Ossie's death. Again, this year, February the 4th, we lost Ossie Davis, so Certainly. his name could be right. added to the earlier roster. The last of several hundred projects they worked on together. I mean, and February the 4th is a significant date because that's Rosa Parks' birthday. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. he died on her birthday, and of course, there was a lot of uh, tension in the uh, press about that, so that was a part of the first round of activities in terms of promoting the book. But the Black Panther Party is very interesting because the, se the last sections in the book, mm -hmm. I deal with the Panthers, and yeah. I show the connection, and I think the thing you talk about about in terms of Rap Brown and, and uh, Kwame Toure, Stokely yeah. Carmichael, mm -hmm. James Foreman, mm -hmm. all being brought into the Black Panther sure. Party and given these here fairly prestigious positions uh, in there. Prime but Minister. It didn't work out though, you know, yeah. the Minister of Information, Minister <laughs> of Defense, Minister of Education, what have you, but it kind of a short-lived relationship because, you know, in terms of how it was brought together, and I talk about that in the book. Mm -hmm. One of the ironies of the Civil Rights Movement has to be James Meredith. Um, because in many ways he was an icon comparable to Rosa Parks. In mm -hmm. the same way that Rosa Parks refused to get up, James Meredith was determined against the advice of a lot of people mm -hmm. to enroll at the University of Mississippi and in a way forced the civil rights movement to follow him there, I mean, so to speak, in order to protect him. And then, then shortly thereafter, he had the, the so-called march, the march, of, the march against fear, mm -hmm. um, because he, in that's 1966, right. he felt that that was where he dragged everybody. That's out. where it right. came that's in, right? right. That's right. Because that's right. he went down the highway there, just outside of Hernando, Mississippi, when he was uh, shot down, mm -hmm. and uh, when he was 
he wasn't killed, but he was severely wounded. So you had members of SNCC and uh, SCLC and what have you, and NAACP just contemplating what can we do mm -hmm. to carry on this initiative. Mm -hmm. So many of them got out there, led by Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael, mm -hmm. decided they'd pick up and continue to march that James Meredith had begun. Also, Koji, we can't re forget that Vivian Malone Jones died mm -hmm. also, and have to be seen in the context of these people struggling to integrate the uh, the colleges down here, the historically black college universities, as you mentioned earlier, was very, sure. very played a key role in SNCC too, including Howard oh, University, definitely. Fisk definitely. University students definitely. at North Carolina A&T, with the sit-ins, the freedom rides, all of it. I talk about all of these things in separate chapters. James Meredith was, though, in many ways, always a loose cannon, so to speak, because mm -hmm. in later years he became a conservative and angered a lot of the leaders of the civil rights <laughs> right. movement by his activity. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it's kind of interesting how you know if you follow I mean you have this your notion now with some of the, uh, the kind of reclamation processes going if, if Dr. King was alive today according to some of these neoconservatives and art segregations that he would be standing with us <laughs> because they're taking out of context you know some of his concerns about you know brotherhood of coming together and everything mm -hmm. but you know the whole color of the skin content of the character affirmative action and what have you Dr. King would be standing I don't think so well one mm -hmm. of the things people can find out if they read we shall overcome is about Dr. King's stance on the Vietnam War. That should give him a pretty good oh, guide. I think so. Where you know, King where he was staying, he would time. probably be opposed to this war in Iraq that's going on at this current time. So, yes, indeed, we have that, as well as the Poor People's Campaign. That was one of his great dreams beyond that before he was taken, snuff, his life snuffed out down there in Memphis and everything. But one of the things people will also see in, in We Shall Overcome is, mm -hmm. the, is the comparison of what Dr. King was aiming for with the Poor People's Campaign mm -hmm. and and compare it to where we stand today in terms of the education of blacks, our relative wealth, our condition of health mm -hmm. uh, as compared to when he was doing. He had, I think, in, embedded in this whole initiative was this uh, a concern about reparations too. Mm -hmm. You know, he certainly, I mean, it was an economic approach. And I think it also marks a, a change in his analysis because now it's more than just, you know, a race question. It becomes a class question. Mm -hmm. And the class thing, along with his, the, as you said earlier, about his internationalization, his concern about empire and imperialism in this country, mm -hmm. as well as the war in Vietnam, signaled that he was on a trajectory, I think, a convergence path with Malcolm X, because Malcolm X was already there in his analysis in terms mm -hmm. of both class and the international situation. And you know, a lot of people will say when you mention Dr. King, oh, the march on Washington. <laughs> well, uh, there was a march on Washington before that march exactly. on Washington. Exactly, that's right. Or at least a threatened a march. A threatened march on yeah, Washington. Tell us about A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph is, a, and, and when you, if, one of the things about this, one of the more treasured moments of the, listening to the CDs, is to hear the stentorian voice of it. one, you know, the Negro people. I mean, <laughs> Paul Robeson had the voice, the end-all voice in terms of resonance and the kind of basso profundo. Mm -hmm. But, uh, hey, A. Philip Randolph was right up there. You talk about when you get back to Rosa Parks, though, mm -hmm. E.D. Nixon. Oh, of course. And he of was course. he was an organizer of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Mm -hmm. That's where he got that union background and union activism. Mm -hmm. Came from uh -huh. P. Philip Randolph. And they were spread all over the country. I mean, Ron Dellums, his father was a member of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Brotherhood Porters. of Sleeping Car Porters. These are like, a uh, film came out called 10,000 Men Named George. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think the significant thing there, too, is with A. Philip Randolph also started The Messenger with Chandler Owen in 1925, which of course is part of the Harlem Renaissance period. Uh -huh. So he was involved. He was all over the place. I mean, and then he threatened. Yes, in he 41, as we on the, on the kind of the precipice of World War II, uh, there was this discrimination, wholesale discrimination in the, in the plants and the factories in this country. So A. Philip Randolph told him, say, look here, he told FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he could speak to Franklin Delano Roosevelt because as head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, oh, he, he was a very powerful union. Man. He yeah. had a very powerful union, so he had to be reckoned with. And he told FDR, say, look here, either you integrate these plants and factories, or we're going to show up 
in Washington with a mass of people that will embarrass this government like never before. And this is like in the midst of World War II now. Uh -huh. So you don't want to, you got to want to come off looking like you're less than democratic because you're out there pushing that whole thing about democracy, yet and still you're not having it practiced in your own country. So they didn't want their enemies to, to make sport of that. So FDR capitulated, 80, uh, Executive Order 80, 8802 was signed, and the plants were integrated. My mother was a beneficiary of that, in fact. Mm -hmm. One of the people who I admired who worked with A. Philip Randolph, who also um, served as a mentor and advisor to a lot of people in SNCC, was Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin. You talk about names. <laughs> <laughs> That's a significant one because yeah, here's someone who came out of the uh, the pacifist movement. Mm -hmm. A.G. Must, you know, and uh, he was concerned with, uh, you know, the war resistors, you know, mm -hmm. the F.O.R., the Fellowship uh, of Reconciliation. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had, in the early 40s, even in 1942, CORE came on the scene. The Congress of Racial Equality. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So even before that, or a, a Contempor uh, concurrent with that, you have the uh, the situation with um, with Bayard Rustin coming on the scene with a number of these peace activists. Mm -hmm. So he got this background. He affiliated himself. You know, he got connected up with A. Philip Randolph. It was the two of them who put together the notion of the March on Washington in 1941. But it would take them, well, it's 22 years later, before 1963, where they had an opportunity to threat turned into a reality. <laughs> in 1995, we had the Million Man March, and in 2005, the Millions More Movement. Mm -hmm. What do you see in the future? I think we have to look at the situation out of the more recent event and see if they can learn from you know, 1995, because there were some great promises put forth then that were not realized. Again, we have like um, a whole roster, a whole litany of uh, objectives and agenda that's packed with uh, social and political issues. And let's see if they can make any of those, many of any of those come to to uh, to fruition. I know you just happened to run into some of the organizers of the Millions More's movement, Ron Walters. Ron and, Walters. And, and uh, who else did you run into? Ron Daniels. Ron Daniels. Yeah, I mean, Joe Madison and Joe Ramona. Madison. Edelin. You know, these are people who were very much involved there, but you know, the whole local organizing committees, Kojo, I think that's the key thing. They had said it in 1995, we got to get it. Her boy, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Us. Thank you, Kojo. And that's it for this edition of Evening Exchange. As always, we welcome your comments. You can email us at eveningexchange at howard.edu. Stay well. Good night. <laughs>